And people say, oh, isn't that lucky chance? No, you're not trusting the sign, the symbol. You're trusting the God, the all-powerful God, the risen Lord Jesus, represented by the cross, the crucifix, the image of the Blessed Mother, or the St Benedict Medal, which is a particularly powerful prayer against evil. And these, this is just Christians invoking the power, the loving God, to ward off evil. And the early Christians used to carry out lay exorcisms. How do we know this? Tertullian, who was an old, very narrow-minded uh, lay theologian in North Africa in the third century, wrote lots and lots of books. We know a lot about what Christian life was like under the last persecutions, thanks to this guy. Uh, mind you, he went wacky and finally left the church and joined a sect, but he was a very narrow-minded person. He was married to a very patient wife. He wrote these books to her how she should be a good wife. So, but in those books, Adulsorum, Lectures to My Wife, imagine being married to a man like that. Anyway, <laughs> wow. But it, it tells us a lot about Christian marriage in the third century, and he was a, he was a sincere man, and she was a patient woman, obviously. But he, he describes, he tells her what she should do on a pagan feast day when she's walking down the street in their neighbourhood and they go past the pagans' houses and this is pagan Roman religion and there's all these garlands around the door and little twinkling lamps and statues of goddesses and little pots of incense burning. And as she goes by, she should do a, a, a blowing exorcism go <laughs> and say a prayer. Now, we laugh at that, but that's the way the early Christians embodied their faith in the Lord. And I'm not saying you should go down the street and when you go past the new white shop, go... <laughs> <laughs> but I do know people who, who superglued a, 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 super a St Benedict medal to a, one of those shops and it shut down a week later, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> they um, also did it to a sex shop in Wagga and it worked even quicker. But, <laughs> <laughs> but see, uh, Christ conquers, Christ, Christ reigns. So we, let's not get too obsessed with these things. Keep, keep the light touch. But remember, we've got all the spiritual means which come from our baptism. We're born again human beings. The Holy Spirit's in us. We don't be scared of these things. So don't ever think, oh, I'm going to get possessed, or if I have some mental worries, it means the devil's coming into me. No, 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 no. Christians keep calm about this. And also, there's another approach which I can recommend if you've got this frame of mind, the rationalistic approach. One of the great experts in this field was a Jesuit called Father Herbert Thurston. And his books are all worth reading, T-H-U-R-S-T-O-N. He died, I think, during the Second World War, an English Jesuit. And he wrote a lot of books on mystical phenomena, the stigmata and all that. And he also did a lot of psychological research, where, where it all came from. And, uh, but he was very rationalistic about it. Strict Jesuit, scientific approach. Where's the evidence? What are the natural explanations that can eliminate the supernatural? I think we have to have quite a bit of that common sense in our heads. There have been other Christian writers, like uh, the famous novelist Robert Hugh Benson, who wrote some fantastic science fiction novels 100 years ago about the world we're living in now. And he, they're really worth reading, particularly The Lord of the World, The Coming of the Antichrist and all that, in 1980-something. Well, it's all past. And... Uh, but he tended to be a bit credulous. He, was, he believed he was always worried about ghosts and spirits and things. Well, some people who live in Europe are a bit like that. It's partly a personality. I try and keep the two parts of my personality, the credulous bit and the scientific bit, in sync. I think it's, it's one way of coping. But if you're very sceptical about these things, good on you. It's a probably healthier attitude than being oh, too credulous. Because that's why the New Age is flourishing. People swallowing of the stuff. I mean, when you think, what on earth has a bit of crystal got to deal with your health? Nothing. Go and talk to medical practitioners, top medical, but they just burst out laughing. And some, some, some natural medicines have got good base because they're based on natural chemicals in plants and things. No worries. But when you start to tinker around with looking at a crystal, that's going to do this and that, and people putting their hands over you, here's the Reiki method and all these radiations are coming, and then after a few sessions they tell you, oh I have a spirit guide behind me, uh oh, that's not natural, we're into the going down the dark track, that's where it starts to slide, so be careful too. Yes? Mm. And some of the things that psychologists and psychiatrists recommend are things that maybe 
meditation, um, yoga, mm. Oh, and, um, I don't think I could think about it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The first question, I would be very careful about yoga. There are levels of it. Some of the meditative basic levels I think are relatively harmless. But there are Christians, and there's a lot of debate um, within, the, within the Catholic community, within the Protestant churches, particularly the evangelical groups, on these questions. But I'll be a bit careful of it. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that people, people with um, struggling with mental problems, some form of meditation, but simple Christian meditation, scripture reading, the normal methods that we have, without going down the yoga track. I'll be careful there. Um, there are forms of yoga which are also not good at all. There's a sexual form of yoga which is corruptive, and there are some forms of yoga which seem to involve spirits. So I'll be cautious about yoga. Um, also martial arts again, but again I've got to be honest there's a big debate among Christians two points of view on that some say a lot of the martial arts are basically just self defence exercise and that but when they start to get all spooky and start to invoke masters, hidden masters uh oh we're going down the bad track careful get out of that but again it's a, there's, a, there's no but the church is not going to say oh no 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 we, we go to the main principles which are set out in the catechism in numbers uh, 2110 through 2117, we go through the essential matters. We don't get to all the fine details. Well, the second area, Freemasonry. Well, I gave a presentation to the Charismatic Renewal down in the hall here in uh, Brunswick at uh, Our Ladies in Nicholson Street a few years ago on this, and... They said, what's, they asked me to give a president on the link between the New Age and Masonry. Well, basically, there, there is and there isn't. Freemasonry is a form of quasi-religion invented in the 17th and more particularly the 18th century in Europe. And it was influenced by the Enlightenment. So it sought to streamline religion and get rid of the particularly Christian things and simplify religion to belief in God, what we call deism. And yet at the same time, to include everybody, they had all different names for God. They came up with one, Yah Bulon. Yah, from the word Yahweh, which we're not supposed to use in our hymns and liturgy anymore because it defends Jews. It's a very holy name to them. Uh, the one God revealed to Moses, Yah. Bull, from Baal, the false god in the Old Testament. And on was from Egypt. So there was syncretistic. Syncretistic means mix and match religion where you you bring together elements. So one of the problems with masonry is it's syncretistic in its religious base. Also, it gathered together intellectual men and women, in, particularly in France and Germany, who were leading the political reforms of the time. It was one of the main forces behind the French Revolution. But a lot of prominent Catholic intellectuals, including some clergy, bishops and cardinals, were in those Masonic lodges at that stage. Mozart was a Freemason. Uh, Haydn, I think, and Handel were also top cult. But then the church could see it was socially disruptive and it tended off towards atheism, especially as the revolution world. And the Vatican began to do research into it and gradually decrees came from the popes forbidding Catholics to be members. So from the late 18th century on, it's been a no-go area for Catholics. In the 1970s, after Vatican II, that started to wobble and people said, oh, well, you know, maybe... maybe." And it went... And some Catholics joined the lodges. Uh, But that has since been pulled back. When the new code of canon law was issued, um, it was made quite clear the next day that the ban on being members of Masonic lodges still stays. Well, what's it got? It's a bit like New Age religion. It comes out of the same barnyard. It's a bit Gnostic and mystical. Um, a lot of it's harmless. It's into secrets. You know, and that's another thing about Gnosticism, secrets. Christianity has no secrets. It's an open religion. 